Right, good evening everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, we're almost full up, which is uh, very good. Welcome to the Geological Society of London and to this, the third Shell Lecture uh, for 2013, entitled Exceptionally Preserved Fossils, Windows on the Evolution of Life. Uh, my name is David Shilston. I'm the president of the Society. And it's my pleasure to thank Shell for making this series of very successful public lectures possible. Um, our understanding of the history and evolution of life on Earth relies heavily on the fossil record, and especially in rare cases of so-called exceptional preservation, where the soft parts of animals, and indeed ent entire soft-bodied organisms, are preserved. Such exceptionally preserved fossils provide unique insights into animal paleobiology, and the true nature of biodiversity, and they have proved crucial in filling the gaps that bedevil the fossil record. They literally flesh out our knowledge of history of life and help to resolve controversies about the biological relationships of animals still alive today. Our speaker today is uh, David Civiter, Emeritus Professor of Paleontology at the University of Leicester and a former chairman of the Micro Paleontological Paleontological Society, a society which is rather larger than its name suggests. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Sivita. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Mr. President, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to give this lecture and I thank the Society for inviting me, and also the sponsors. These are fossils, and this is my business. I'm a paleontologist, and I have the supreme privilege to look at beautiful things every day. That's not just the people who are walking around the campus. <laughs> it's these things. I've always considered it to be a great privilege to be a paleontologist, uh, and fortunate to make a career out of it. So fossils vary in their shapes and sizes uh, from minute pinhead sized fossils like this to dinner plate fish to fellows like this which every school boy knows. This is a uh, Tyrannosaurus rex which I fortunately had the great privilege of uh, putting together uh, for an exhibition which still stands in my university geology department did this about three or four years ago, and uh, not many paleontologists can say that they put a T-Rex together, but I, I have, and that's almost a crowning glory on, on my career. Um, but although fossils are beautiful, and aesthetically they're so uh, beautiful to look at, we mustn't forget that fossils are, to us, very important scientific tools. So I'd just like to take a few moments, if I may, to tell you why fossils are important. Uh, firstly, they help us reconstruct lost worlds. The rocks that you see here are of Silurian age, 425 million years. It's a quarry in the Welsh borderland in the county of Shropshire. And if you look very closely, actually here and here, the rocks are very replete with corals. Here we see a beautiful little coral colony and there are others through here. Now, if we go to modern environments, this is a photograph off the barrier reef, we can also see corals. And using the simple principle of uniformitarianism, the present is the key to the past, uh, we can take information about the conditions under which these modern corals live and transfer it back to the fossil record. So modern corals normally live only in warm, shallow, sunlit environments and in salty water, normal marine salinities. So we can take that information back to these rocks in Shropshire and interpret lost worlds, the, the condition under which these ancient corals grew. I might add that the time we're talking about England was in the subtropics, a little bit different from uh, what we have today. Um, fossils can also help in reconstructing paleogeography. Now this is a, a map of the world uh, at about 525 20, 25 million years ago, and it's very different, of course. Uh, Britain, you might be interested, is here, about 60 degrees latitude south, and it feels like it uh, today. Um, the continents are not where you might expect them. Here is Scandinavia, here is ancient North America, 
And that picture of ancient paleogeography was put together using a lot of geological information um, from structural geology and plate tectonics uh, to geophysics. But also the point I want to make is that us paleontologists have a crucial part to play in assembling ancient continents and testing ancient paleogeography from an entirely different and independent viewpoint. Um, I just draw your attention to this, South China, with this worm here, because this marks the occurrence of a particular uh, exceptionally preserved fossil biota called the Chenjiang biota, which I'll come to in a moment. Fossils also are very important in dating and correlating rocks. Um, this is uh, a stratigraphic sequence from the age of the Earth about 4.6 billion years ago to the present. And uh, fossils occur in layers, and they can be used to characterize layers. As William Smith, whose beautiful portrait adorns the reception area here at the Geological Society, as he instructed us, uh, in the early 19th century. Uh, fossil layers are characterized by, uh, layers of rock are characterized by different uh, types of fossils, and we can use this characterization to date layers and hence to correlate them across the globe. The other uh, facet which is important, uh, importantly illustrated in this slide, is that, of course, life changes through time. Evolution takes place from very primitive uh, forms of life here, uh, two, even three billion years plus, some people would argue, to uh, forms of life with uh, uh, nucleus in the cell, to forms of life that we recognize today. There's a gradual change. Now, of course, it was Darwin who gave us the mechanism for evolution by natural selection, but one might argue that fossils provide the direct evidence. We can go out and test theories using fossil evidence uh, in the rock record. The fossil record is pretty damn good, actually. Um, possibly better than we might expect. Perhaps various estimates, but perhaps 15% of life forms are eventually fossilized. Many types of life are lost to the fossil record. They are not preserved. So the fossil record is biased. So if we can find fossil biotas which lessens that biased nature, these are very important. And this is what is the subject of my talk this evening. This is how paleontologists normally operate. Here we have a large Jurassic vertebrate being uh, excavated. Uh, and we normally find bones, in this case vertebrates, uh, or shells of animals. The chances of soft part preservation, or something like a jellyfish, are, are, are pretty slim. Here we come into the biased nature of the fossil record. And yet, the vast majority of animals living in marine environments today are either entirely soft-bodied or largely soft-bodied. So we stand the chance of losing in the fossil record a large part of life as it's evolved through time. Occasionally, we find exceptionally preserved fossils like this mammoth from the Siberian tundra. And when we do that, when we've got the soft parts, the soft tissues and the hard parts, this is really the jewel in the paleontological crown. It gives us a window, an insight into the paleobiology of animals, uh, the paleoecology of the biota that you're looking at the evolution and affinity of these animals. It gives us that insight which would be impossible to get if the bones alone remained. So this is the nature of an exceptionally preserved biota. They have a special term, Lagerstätten. Uh, essentially comes from German mine, mining tradition, which means a kind of mother load of fossils. And uh, Lagerstätten are dotted through the geological record, there are about sort of 15 or so blockbusters, very important. Uh, but scattered all the way through the geological record, you might find examples of a fossil here and there showing exceptional preservation. And what I want to do now is to show you some exceptionally preserved biotas through time 
and concentrate on two in particular, which I and my colleagues have, have been working on. I suppose if I asked any schoolboy, or maybe anybody in this audience, name me one Lagerstetten, then this would come to mind. This is the iconic Burgess Shale, Cambrian in age, Middle Cambrian, and it was here in the first decade of the last century on these slopes that Charles Walcott um, discovered the famous Burgess Shale biota, of which this is one fossil. Um, you can see that it has not only got the hard shell preserved, but also elements of the soft parts. These are antennae sticking from the front uh, of this arthropod. And the Burgess Shale, for a century, has acted like a beacon of exceptionally preserved fossils. Much studied, much lauded, and hugely important scientifically. But in the last 20 years, um, there has been another uh, Cambrian biota <laughs> coming on stream, exceptionally preserved, which certainly rivals the Burgess Shale. And that biota is called the Xinjiang biota, and it occurs here. Many of you, I'm sure, have been to China. Uh, this is Emperor Wan Li, who was the longest serving Ming emperor, ruled for 47 years. And of course, emperors uh, had palaces. This is the Forbidden Palace. I love this building. It's, it's named the Hall of Perfect Harmony. Beautiful name, where the emperor used to receive guests and take refreshments. And of course, emperors got buried, like this one, Terracotta Army, uh, Emperor Qin, uh, who first unified China in many ways. This, the Terracotta Army, was discovered in 1974. Just 10 years later, in 1984, a Chinese scientist called Ho Xiang Wang, good colleague and friend, uh, discovered the Chenjiang biota in Yunnan province in southern China. And it's a scientific discovery of great importance, at least equal to that of the Burgess Shale. And the discovery was made here in southern China. Uh, there's Beijing, Nanjing. This is the area which is uh, magnified here. Shenyang, where the fauna was discovered, is just south of the Chinese city of Kunming, the capital of Yunnan province, which has about 40,000 people in it, uh, the province that is. Um, I always think, again, I'm privileged to work in China, and particularly in Yunnan, which for me is the most exciting part of China, because not only is it at a topographic cross crossroads uh, at the eastern end uh, of the uh, Tibetan plateau, it's also a cultural crossroads. China has about 40 ethnic minority races, and the vast majority, like this Bai minority lady, are, are in Kun uh, Kunming province. Uh, and so it's an exciting place to, to actually work for many different reasons. And as I say, in 1984, Ho Xiang Wang discovered the Chenjiang biota quite by accident, uh, in a way. Um, and the rest is history. Um, interesting, the French were into Kunming and Yunnan province, mapping it geologically, in the first decade of the last century. So exactly when Walcott was discovering the Burgess Shale in North America, the French were mapping Yunnan province. And here's a geological map. It's in the archives of the society. This is where I obtained it from. Um, this is the geological map <coughs> of the Cambrian around Fuxian Lake near Chenjiang. The town of Chenjiang is here. And they collected fossils and they published them in monographs, published in the first two decades <coughs> of the last century. But no soft-bodied fossils. These soft-bodied fossils lay waiting for another 80 or so years. Just think what might have happened had the French discovered soft-bodied fossils at the same time as Walcott had discovered the Burgess Shale. Interesting, isn't it? <coughs> the French also left other um, edifices on the landscape. I was amazed after field work. Um, to find a Catholic church in southern China. And I was amazed to go into the church and find that the stained glass windows didn't have religious iconography. They are grapes. And these are vineyards. 
So here you have Chinese wine industry flourishing. And as we all know, they're buying up the world's best wine. Are they the ninth producer now and probably the, about the ninth or tenth consumer of wine? So, yes, this is funded now by Hong Kong money. But the French left a lot, but they didn't discover the Chenjiang biota. <coughs> um, this is where we do our field work here in the hills surrounding Fushan Lake. Very beautiful area. Uh, and this is how we do it. We employ local labor. And forgive me, but it's very sexist. Uh, the guys actually do the backbreaking work of getting large chunks of rock, mudstone and siltstone, from the uh, outcrop. And the ladies, who otherwise would be tending the paddy fields, the ladies are just brilliant at finding beautiful fossils. They have an eye, which they develop very quickly. And they can find a fossil even where a professional paleontologist wouldn't find a fossil. So these are valuable members of the team breaking open rocks to discover fossils <coughs> and what fossils they discover. <coughs> um, this is a worm, 525 million years old and as fresh as a daisy. It's almost as if it died yesterday. It has all the features here of the anterior end preserved. This dark trace here is, we presume, to be the gut. So you're looking at the last, the, the preservation of the last meal this, that this worm had all those uh, millions of years ago. Um, worms are a common component of the Chenjiang biota, and we find trace fossils, the remains of traces through the sediment where uh, presumably worm-like animals uh, burrowed on their way to try and find food. So we have animals living in the sediment at that time. <coughs> and we have animals living on the sediment at that time. <coughs> here we've got a purported sea anemone, reconstructed here. This is the actual specimen. And here undoubtedly are sponges. Now sponges are just bags of jelly held together by um, mineral spicules, silica, <coughs> calcite, in, so in other cases. But here, and normally as paleontologists, we find them just as spicules in residues when we break down rock. We very rarely find complete ones. These are complete sponges. Here is the reconstruction uh, on the sea bottom. And it would sit there filtering water through <coughs> uh, and obtaining food in that way. And uh, these are of different sizes. And so even in the lower Cambrian, we had what ecologists would term tearing of animals. Animals sitting on the bottom at different sizes, grabbing different parts of the water column for food. That would be at a lower tier than that particular um, sponge. <coughs> and every time I look at this animal, it's difficult to, to believe what you're looking at. You're almost hallucinating. Um, it's a worm-like animal, but a worm with legs. 16 pairs of legs, and it used this to crawl across the substrate. Um, it belongs to a group which paleontologists call lobopods, uh, and uh, some people would have that they are related to a modern group um, of animals called the velvet worms, the onychophores. Uh, interestingly, modern velvet worms are terrestrially based. They live on land, but this is, of course, in a fully marine environment, so a different ecological aspect. But a beautiful specimen, and there's not just this genus, but other genera uh, of lobopods. Uh, there are about half a dozen genera of lobopods now found uh, in the Chenjiang biota. So this thing would be crawling on the bottom, uh, and so would this thing here. <coughs> this is uh, a genus named after that lake, Fuxan Lake, so this is Fuxan Huia, and uh, it's a beautiful arthropod. You can see the segmentation here. Um, there's the head shield. Notice, if you will, here, those there are eyes. Now, this is the first time in the geological record uh, that you have a lot of animals with eyes in the Lower Cambrian. Just think what that means in ecological terms. For the first time, animals can see, and they can be seen. For the first time, animals can hunt, and they can be hunted. It's not too difficult to see a kind of ecological arms race 
developing because of the advent of vision. This pair of diagrams comes from a paper by Marshall Yar, actually one of my ex-research students with colleagues at Leicester, who is now at the Natural History Museum working with Greg Edgecombe. And in Nature, late last year, she published a <laughs> specimen of Fuxan Huia, which showed the eyes here. And this, incredibly, is the brain. So we have the eye capsules here with uh, nerve centers, the retina, and various parts of the brain which operate uh, appendages. It's uh, an incredible feat of preservation to have such detail preserved. This is a reconstruction of uh, Fuxan Yue uh, as it might have appeared walking on the, on the sea bottom. And we have animals that are swimming off the bottom in the water column, perhaps near the bottom. This is a beautifully preserved arthropod called uh, Leancolia. Uh, the head area is here, tail is here. We're looking in a lateral view. Uh, and this is uh, uh, an appendage sticking out of the front. But I'll draw your attention to these appendages, that one, that one, that one. These are large paddle-shaped appendages. Um, easily to see how these might be adapted for locomotion, uh, for swimming. Uh, and this thing probably, we think, swam on or near the bottom. And it would be joined in that particular realm by trilobites and trilobite-like relatives. Uh, this uh, is an arthropod called uh, a neuroid. And neuroids are believed to be trilobites by some workers and not trilobites by others. Um, but neuroids are interesting because they are fully soft-bodied. Unlike trilobites, they don't have a hard carapace. And uh, trilobites and neuroids would have joined this fellow uh, swimming uh, in, in a, a nectobenthic uh, habitat. Uh, neuroids, some of them, in fact, have beautiful appendages. There is the biramus appendage, the outer branch with uh, filaments. Maybe they use this for gills. Uh, and the inner branch maybe for, for walking uh, with spines on the end here, which may have been used for scavenging uh, food. <coughs> there is a whole plethora of bivalved arthropods, arthropods which have two shells and then soft parts in between. This is one of them called isoxis. Again, appendages for locomotion, beautifully developed eyes, which you can see here. And uh, this one, this particular genus, Isoxis, we find it in many localities worldwide. We, we have it in North America, we have it in Greenland, we have it in China and so on. This fellow could get around. It was a real swimmer. Um, and here we have what might be viewed as the top of the food chain in the Chenjiang biota. This is uh, an animal called, uh, well, it's an, an anomalocarid. Anomalocarids are known. They're one of the iconic fossils in the Burgess Shale. Uh, and these things were serious animals. They are estimated to be over a metre in size, top of the food chain in the Lower Cambrian Sea. And they're armed with raptorla appendages at the front here. And if we were to turn this animal over, it has a ring of plates to deal with the food surrounding the mouth. These are just uh, a pair of these raptorla appendages uh, preserved in Chenjiang. So this was a, a serious uh, animal, if it came towards you, in the Lower Cambrian Sea. Um, and was uh, a kind of king in the ecosystem there. And for those of you who like fishing, we have what is purported to be the world's earliest vertebrate here, earliest fish. Um, the Chenjiang biota was originally discovered in Chenjiang and surrounding areas, uh, but it's been now found wider afield. And the sedimentary basin, which contains these soft-bodied fauna, stretches over several hundred uh, square kilometers. And to the west of Chenjiang in Haikou, I'm here trying to find these fellows, which are the world's earliest uh, purported vertebrates. Uh, we've got purported sensory organs here, a dorsal fin, muscle blocks going down the back, and gills. Here, reconstructed. If you'd have told me when I started my career that we would have vertebrates in the Cambrian and so beautifully preserved, I would say nonsense. But we have them. And this particular fossil really has no rights whatsoever to, 
to, to be preserved to get into the fossil record. Uh, it's a, a sea gooseberry, a tenophore, or comb jelly. And here it is in all its glory, and it locomotes through the water column by having rows of cilia aligned along its body area. And it has tentacles here, which is used in the modern uh, sea gooseberries to, to get food. This is just a bag of jelly and shouldn't really be preserved in rocks 525 million years old, but it is. So we can put this kind of information together and see that animals in the lower Cambrian were doing all the kinds of things that we expect animals to do at the present time. We have animals floating in the water column and swimming in the water column. This is that large predator, by the way, Anomala carried, uh, dealing with one of its prey. There's the ring of, of plates around its mouth, uh, grasping the prey. It looks uh, like an arthropod there, grasping the prey uh, with these raptorial appendages. We've got animals on the bottom, rooted on the bottom. Uh, we've got animals vagile, crawling across the bottom. We've got animals burrowing into the sediment. So this image tells us two things, really. Firstly, the Chenjiang biota is the most important biota in the world for uh, reconstructing uh, lower Cambrian ecosystems. There are other deposits, as I'll mention later on in the, in the lecture, but this is the most complete and diverse. There are more than 200 species and 16 phyla described now from the Chenjiang biota. And you're looking at a snap picture of the world's earliest complex marine ecosystem. And this thing would probably have been repeated, uh, not just in China, but elsewhere. Um, this is a very interesting fossil from Chenjiang. And when we saw it down the microscope, we couldn't quite believe what we were looking at. Um, <coughs> It's a chain, a daisy chain of fossils. And there are more than 20 individuals here. And when you look at them in detail, you'll find that one individual, it has a shell and a tail with segments. It's got its tail popped into the front end of the animal behind it. And there's a polarity to these animals. They're all facing in the same way. They're not random. And for our money, we described this in science uh, about three years ago. For our money, this is an arthropod. It's got all the characteristics one might like to find in an arthropod, except for legs. We don't have the legs, which is unfortunate, the appendages. <coughs> um, but what was it doing? Why were these arthropods 525 million years ago in a daisy chain? We tried to look to modern analogues to see if we could find some hints. Um, were they doing it for defense, for protection? Were they doing it for migration? For example, lobsters migrate in a train. If you go to the Caribbean, you'll find lobsters migrating in a, in a train. But there's a very big difference between a train and a chain. This is an integrated linear chain with polarity. So what were they doing? Defense, migration, sex? Were they coupling for reproduction? Answers on a postcard, please, because we couldn't answer that question. But what it gives us here is a snapshot of the earliest good example of collective behavior in animals. If I go to China and I see a group of Chinese school children walking outside school, they walk exactly like that, hand in hand in a chain. It's collective behavior. This is collective behavior in arthropods. And the Chenjiang biota throws up real oddities we're not able to explain um, easily. And it gives us a lot of thought as to how animal body plans are assembled together. This is the eponymous genus called Yunanozoon, after Yunnan province. And it is what you see. Um, what are these? Are these segments? Is it an arthropod? Are they muscle blocks? Is it a, a chordate? Is it a worm? What are these holes here? Are they 
areas which some people have suggested for gills. The take home message here is that we don't know in many cases what some of the animals are. We are still learning about their true affinity. But here uh, you have a case in point of animals assembling a peculiar body plan and that's important to try and uh, determine what it is if we're to sort out relationships and evolution. <coughs> The Chenjiang biota is by no means the only exceptionally preserved biota in, um, in uh, the world uh, from the Lower Cambrian. Um, we have other exceptionally preserved fossils like this one we published uh, uh, four or five years ago now. This is a millimeter long microarthropod, less than the size of a pinhead, but all the appendages beautifully preserved, including these epipods and beautiful eyes. All that in a pinhead. Same age as Chen Zhang. Uh, Greg Edgecombe and colleagues at the Natural History Museum in Australia have described beautifully preserved um, eyes here from an exceptionally preserved biota uh, in Kangaroo Island in uh, Australia, the Emu Bay Shale biota. And these have beautiful lenses. Can you see the lenses in this compound eye? to show that sophisticated vision was already in place in the Lower Cambrian. <clears throat> the Chenjiang biota is very important, not least it helps us try and address this question, which actually a conference here in the Society addressed just, what was it, 10 days ago. Unfortunately, I was in America and couldn't attend, but I gather the meeting was exceedingly enjoyable one. And, uh, this comes from a paper published in Nature by Doug Erwin and, and, and uh, company. Uh, here we have geological time. There is the Cambrian, Precambrian boundary there. And the Chenjiang biota is that line there. It represents a splurge, this yellow splurge, in the fossil record of taxa, which uh, then go on to give us the modern fauna. Without the Chenjiang biota, our knowledge would have to jump up a little bit uh, to the Burgess Shale, Middle Cambrian. But here we have in Cambrian series two, stage three, the Chenjiang biota. Um, of course, the Cambrian radiation is one of the old chestnuts of paleontology. Is it fact or is it fiction? Um, did it really happen? And if it happened, why did it happen? Um, as I say, a whole conference was held on that recently, so uh, I don't intend to open that debate here. But Doug Irwin, in his elegant paper in Nature, said that the developmental toolkit, the genetic changes needed to assemble all these various forms of life, came from the cryogenian, from about 640 to uh, 800 or so million years. Uh, the developmental toolkit in terms of uh, genes was assembled then, and what we get here in the late Precambrian, and uh, oops, oh, I think my point has just gone dead on me. Uh, well, oh no, it's there. Uh, what we get in the in the higher part of the uh, column in the Cambrian is, in fact, uh, the ecological success story of the genetic changes that were occurring lower down in the uh, geological record. Of course, uh, this man, Charles Darwin. Uh, scratched his head long and hard about the uh, the, the so-called what we now call the Cambrian radiation and uh, it was even more perplexing for him because he didn't have the benefit of knowing that in the pre-Cambrian we have organic wall microfossils and the Ediacaran biota in, uh, in Australia to provide uh, just two examples of uh, a pre-Cambrian fossil record. <coughs> The Chenjiang biota is a fully marine, shallow marine uh, ecosystem. And I just want to illustrate in the next two or three images um, how paleontologists also have snapshots of life on land, not just in the marine environment, but in uh, terrestrial uh, ecosystems. This is what uh, Aberdeenshire looked like uh, about 390, 400 million years ago. This is the reconstruction of uh, a famous paleontological locality called the Rhiney Chert. It's effectively a siliceous hot spring. 
which gave rise to exceptional preservation of early land plants here and early land animals, arthropods. So here we have an intimate association, not long after animals and land uh, animals and, uh, and plants decided it would be a good idea to get out of the sea onto land. Here we have an intimate association, a co-evolution, if you will, of animals uh, and early land plants. And the Rhiney chert is not only important in giving us this snapshot of this uh, co-evolutionary phenomenon, but also it contains the world's earliest uh, insects. If we jump up the stratigraphic column, then we can jump to this iconic fossil, Archaeopteryx, which, of course, uh, there is a specimen in the, in the Natural History Museum uh, and specimens in Berlin. And uh, Archaeopteryx gives us one of those very important fossils, which often are termed loosely missing links. Um, the skeleton is reptilian-like, uh, but, of course, it contains feathers. And uh, once lauded as a, as, as, as a bird, we now know this to be a kind of what we call now in the trade a dino bird. It's a, a therapsid dinosaur with uh, feathers. And um, this specimen is uh, a famous one. Uh, and even more recently, dino birds like Archaeopteryx, which gives us information uh, about the transition between two major groups of animals, uh, dinosaurs like Archaeopteryx, uh, similar, have been found uh, in China, in the Cretaceous of China, for example. This is one of them. Um, when I um, assembled the exhibition on T. rex in my department at Leicester, the basis of my display was um, flying dinosaurs, the evolution uh, of flight and the birds, and I wanted a dino bird to go in the exhibition. You'll be surprised how much uh, I was asked to pay for, for one, and there's all kinds of legal and ethical reasons why I shouldn't purchase one. So I had one cast at the Vertebrate Paleontology Institute in, in Beijing. And then, of course, I wanted, I said, it'd be a great idea to have a model, wouldn't it, of, of my dino bird. This is a Cretaceous dino bird, a dinosaur with feathers. I thought it'd be a great idea to have a model. And then the call came back from Toronto, where I was having... Um, T-Rex manufactured, uh, what colour would you like your bird? I never really thought about that. And I said, oh gosh, maybe uh, off the shoulder pink or... I don't know. Um, and this was well, when I was putting the exhibition together about four years ago. Um, now, subsequently, we have colleagues like Mike Benton in, in Bristol and others who've published in learned journals that we can get pigments, melanosomes they're called, from dino birds, and we can analyze these pigments geochemically. Don't ask me how because it's not my field, but we can an analyze these, these pigments geochemically and, and uh, work out what the color scheme of ancient uh, vertebrates would be, where these melanosomes are found. I decided to have my dino bird coloured green, and I hope you like it. But um, <laughs> you know, if 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 we uh, if we were to find melanosomes from this particular uh, bird, which is called Confucianus, uh, after Confucius, the, the the famous Chinese philosopher, then maybe uh, we find out really whether my green colour was was right or not. Um, and here, just one final terrestrial ecosystem is. Um, <coughs> a very intimate association of a male and female spider. They're, they're trying to make love, they're copulating. And this is a 40 million, million year old piece of amber, preserved uh, beautifully uh, from tree resin in the Baltic. Uh, and that, of course, is a moment that you couldn't hope to capture, really, in a fossil record, but we do. And it tells us stuff about social behavior and all kinds of things that we couldn't, we couldn't dream about. Maybe some ladies have amber. Examine it carefully. You might have, you might have naughty spiders in it. Now, there's one period in uh, geological history which has so far furnished not very many exceptionally preserved biotas. And this might be an accident, or there might be some real reason for it, but it's the Silurian period of time. 
in the Lower Paleozoic. And until the late 1990s, we only had two or three almost apologies for exceptionally preserved biotas in the Silurian. But then in the late 1990s, a new one was discovered of Silurian age, not, when, not anywhere exotic, but in the Welsh borderland, in the good old county of Herefordshire. And here we are on site, working on the Herefordshire biota with my colleagues, Derek Briggs from Yale, Derek Civita from Oxford, uh, Mark Sutton from Imperial College, that's a team who've been working on this. And this is a volcanic ash, an ancient volcanic ash. And in that volcanic ash, we find nodules. And in those nodules, we find lumps of calcite. And it doesn't look much, does it? But that lump of calcite there is a fully three-dimensional soft-bodied worm of mid-Silurian age, 425 million years old. As soon as we realize that, we can say, cripes. Fossilization must be very fast to preserve a three-dimensional worm. And cripes, if we've got a worm, then we've got the chance of reconstructing the entire biota. Because worm would be one of the first things to go. When you look down the microscope at fossils in these nodules, the nodules are composed of calcite and quartz and clay minerals. This is what they look like. And I think everybody in this audience would say, yeah, that's a snail. I can recognize the helicoid pattern. No problem. But then, what is this? Is that an arthropod? Are these legs? What is this? Is it a worm? Are these segments? The problem we faced as professional paleontologists is we could tell you briefly uh, and cursory what these might be, but we had no real idea. And the real problem is we can't grab the fossil out of the rock because there is no physical or chemical technique to grab the science, grab the fossil from the rock. We couldn't get it out. So what we did was to destroy the fossil. And we destroy the fossil by grinding away at 20 micron in intervals. And after each 20 micron grind, we take a digital image. And then we get all of these digital images, in hundreds of them in some fossils, and stitch them together. This is what we thought was a worm. You can see here the calcite, coarse in the middle, fine around the outside, and let's hope the technology works. We're grinding away. This is a video file through that 40 millimeter fossil. 20 microns. Remember, there are 1,000 microns in a millimeter to give you some idea of scale. So, the fossil is gone, but we have all the digital information. And when we stitch that together, this is the fossil. It's not something I ever imagined I would see in my lifetime. What we thought was a worm, because it's vermiform. And this is the head region, which should attach onto, onto there. What we thought was a worm is, in fact, a mollusk, a vermiform mollusk. How many worms do you know with shells on the back? You don't. It has shells on the back, spines throughout. This area here is uh, a cavity <laughs> with gills inside. And this worm is a primitive worm. And it's telling us something fundamental about the relationship of primitive mollusks. These are two primitive groups of mollusks. This is a polyplicophoran. It has many shells. It's called chitin in general terms. And this is an aplicophoran. It's a mollusk without shells. And what this fossil is telling us is we've got a, an aplicophoran-like body, but with shells. It's telling us something fundamental about the primitive state of these mollusks, which we couldn't hope to get unless we've got an exceptionally preserved fossil. We do have real worms, bristle worms. This is a polychaete. Um, again, preserved in three dimensions. <coughs> um, we're all familiar with bristle worms. Um, no school boy has ever carried a bucket and spade onto a, 
onto a seashore has failed to find a bristle worm. Uh, normally, all, we've, all we have in the fossil record of bristle worms is their jaw apparatus, what micropaleontologists call skeletons. There are three or four examples through the stratigraphic record where we have some body parts of um, polychaetes, bristle worms, but they are exceedingly rare and nothing achieves this level of detail with all the mouth parts here and various parapodia along here, including the extensions which are brachia gills for breathing. It's an exceptional preservation and giving us an insight into uh, the evolution of this essentially soft body Groot. We do have snails. This is uh, uh, what Gutsy looked like in the rock. Uh, Gutsy turned out to be a snail, and here we have the anus, uh, the intestine, the stomach, the head foot region, including uh, the radula here in, in orange. Interestingly, we haven't got the dustbin lid, the operculum, which you know, closes the trap door and protects the soft parts. And with this level of preservation, we should have an operculum in that gastropod. So maybe this gastropod lives like some of its modern relatives. It has no operculum and it attaches, attaches onto other animals like echinoderms for protection and also to grab some, some of their food. It's the only known gastropod in the Paleozoic with soft parts. Uh, and an early crown group mollusk with soft parts, which is very rare. We have brachiopods, um, and this was it in the rock. And this projection turned out to be um, a pedicle. And it tells us that this particular brachiopod has a real physical tether onto the substrate or the uh, object to which it's uh, attached. Uh, it's not like a modern brachiopod, which has papillae for chemical resorption. This is like a boat being moored on the side. And it's an important lesson. It tells us not to take what we know from the modern record and interpret the fossil record as being the same, because it's not. This is a beautiful animal, and uh, it's got epibionts attached to it. It's got brachiopods on brachiopods. So we've got a nice little paleoecological story here. And if I had time, we could dissect that and uh, show you the, the lophophore inside. This is the first fossil we found in Herefordshire. Uh, and it's stunning because it's only six millimeters long. But it's beautiful with all these appendages here and gills at the bottom. This is what we called Ophicolus. Because the locality in Herefordshire is not too far from Offa's Dyke. So Offercolus is a kind of iconic fossil. And as I say, from tail to head, six millimetres. And what you're looking at here is an early example of lineages which led to the, to the king crab, the modern Limulus. Um, a word about how these things were preserved. Um, this is a, a little bit of geochemistry, but uh, this is Ophicolus, and we are doing microprobe analysis here for uh, uh, calcium. And uh, here we've got an enrichment of calcium inside the fossil and a depletion outside the fossil in the nodule. And we think that the calcium to form the calcium in calcium carbonate, the calcite which uh, uh, preserves this animal, we, we think the calcium was sourced from, from the nodule and maybe the bicarbonate was sourced from the decay of, uh, of the animal. Um, there's also... Uh, clay minerals which sort of template the fossils around the outside. So this was a kind of working model we published. Uh, Paddy Orr, uh, who was our postdoc at the time, uh, in the Jolsoc, Jolsoc publication. Um, Volcano set off, submerged and smothered animals. Um, then the animals started to decay. But at the same time, uh, an envelope of, of clay minerals went around the outside. And then this is the part which we really haven't cracked. How do you preserve a three-dimensional fossil and quickly infuse calcium carbate in it and just preserve it like that in a snapshot of time before you get collapse? Very difficult. We have a PhD student, David Riley at Leicester, who, who's hoping to provide some of the answers, but it's very difficult. Then the, the nodule formed. 
We think the nodule was almost pini contemporaneous with the formation of calcite. And the nodule, of course, gives you the long-term <laughs> preservability of the fossil itself. We have other arthropods. Um, this was Strangley. Strangley was, or the Flying Fortress, as, as it was sometimes called, uh, was, was in our collections for several years. We had one specimen. We don't like to send a specimen to the guillotine unless we've got two specimens, for obvious reasons. But in the end, um, our frustration over it came the better of us. And uh, when we reconstructed it, it was a Silurian sea spider, a Pycnogonid. And modern Pycnogonids like this one, of course, are very common in modern seas, from the Arctic to the tropics. They're found at several thousand meters depth. They're very rare in the fossil record. There are a few examples in the Devonian, the Hundrick Slate in Germany, the bits and pieces in the Cambrian, the Austin, in the Baltic. Uh, but really, this is the best preserved fossil Pycnogonid we have from the fossil record. Humpy turned out to be a Malacostracon. You can see why we call it Humpy. That was the shell. Uh, Humpy was a Malacostracon. It's a relative of the shrimp and the uh, lobster and the crab. Beautiful developed appendages, beautiful eyes here at the front. And Trunky was a revelation because we had two specimens of Trunky and uh, it turned out to be nothing less than a Silurian barnacle. But two stages in the life cycle of a Silurian barnacle. This is the free living larval stage. And when barnacles decide they want to grow up and settle down, they put their head, this area here, on a rock, the peduncle, and then secrete shells around, five calcitic shells. And they become big. The life cycle of a barnacle hasn't changed in 425 million years. And here we have a nice little example of bioerosion. Um, this is a famous fossil for many reasons. I, I should almost say infamous fossil. This is, this is horny. And horny, uh, because of these horn-like projections, turned out to be a microarthropod, an ostracod. Now, any of you who've got ponds or lakes or rivers near your homes have ostracods. They're the commonest form of arthropod in the fossil record. They uh, are present in their countless thousands of species today. And here we have a, a four or five millimeter long Silurian ostracod. And when we dissect it virtually, we have all the appendages. We have the first appendage, the second appendage, the mandible, the third, fourth, and fifth appendages. This is a seventh, and this is a gills. And here we have, incredibly, the penis preserved. So you're looking at the world's oldest phallic organ. <laughs> and the general body plan of this Silurian ostracod is exactly the same as that modern counterpart from Japan. Here's the penis there. There are the gills and so on. The basic body plan hasn't changed in this group over all those millions of years. And just what this one find extended back the paleobiology of our knowledge of this group by more than 200 million years. And, of course, we've got the world's, the world's earliest male here, if you will. And uh, the, the world's media, of course, had a field day with this. Um, <laughs> uh, I won't give any prizes. Uh, for guessing which celebrated English newspaper this this came from, um, but my favourite in, is in the the headline in the New York Times, which said, "Yes, it's definitely a boy." Uh, it was enormous fun, and uh, the media went viral for about two weeks. But of course, we are looking at an important scientific find here because it, it's a verifiable male, 425 million years old. And then, of course, the quest was on to find a female, and we indeed did find a female. Not of the same species, but this is another ostracod from Herefordshire. And if we dissect it virtually, which we can do, because that's what we're about, everything here is virtual fossils. And stop it there. Here, posteriorly, we have a juvenile and eggs, and it has the same brooding strategy as 
the modern equivalent ostracod. Brute care of the young was occurring in the same way in this group of arthropods 425 million years ago. And there are others which I don't have time to tell you. This is a Morella morph, again from Herefordshire. Morella, of course, is an iconic fossil from the Burgess Shale. And here we have a Silurian Morella morph, beautifully preserved, with all the appendages in the head and a set of 35 appendages in the body, giving us immense detail, telling us that Morella morphs uh, are probably uh, cousins uh, of uh, a large group of arthropods called the mandibulates, which include the crustacea and the hexapods and the myriapods. So we're putting together this Herefordshire biota now, and this is what it's looking like. I mean, this is exciting. This is what paleontologists try to do. We're trying to re-establish, reconstruct an ecosystem. It's not Jurassic Park. It's a Silurian marine equivalent. We're looking at a Silurian seascape, and all of these animals exist on them. And we've published most of these now, and some to be published. This thing here is a genus of ostracod called Pauline, which we... Uh, beautiful ostracod, another ostracod which we, um, which we published uh, before Christmas in the proceedings of the Royal Society. Um, and of course, because we've got this information digitally, that's wonderful. We were fortunate enough to be accepted to exhibit at the Royal Society Summer Exhibition a few years ago. And we thought, well, we want some models. And of course, because we've got the information digitally, we can take it along to a rapid prototype laboratory, and overnight they will sinter out our models, sitting on uh, Silurian sand, if you will. So this is spiny, this is hairy, this is leggy, all, all reconstructed. And remember, these aren't sort of reconstructions in the sense that they're model reconstructions. These are real individual animals that lived on a seabed, warts and all, because they, they are assembled from real data, from individual fossils. Just to give you a flavour, to finish off, these are some of the animals which we've just published or almost on the point of publishing. This is a, another Armored Apricophoran which we published um, just before uh, Christmas last year in, the, in Nature. This is a new uh, sort of uh, king crab relative which we, again we published in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and just to give you something to think about, what's that toilet brush? I mean, what is it? It's almost defying belief, but that's a real animal. And what's this? Just to show you how exceptional this preservation is. These CT are no more than 10 microns thick. And they come from the end of the head, and they go the length of the body, and they are just frozen in time. They are not collapsed. They are not damaged in any way. So uh, Dandy and Pretty will appear on a new stand near you in the, in the future. But this is the game we're playing. We've had this fossil now for many years. Um, this fossil, what is it? Are these antennae? Are these legs? Is this a tail? Could it be that this Herefordshire fossil is the equivalent of a velvet worm? Is this an onychophore? Maybe. Could be. Possibly. Perhaps. We won't know until we destroy it. I'll finish by saying this fossil found in Herefordshire was preserved under volcanic ash. And we should ask the obvious question, where did the ash come from? Now, for those of you who know about uh, volcanicity in the geological column, there ain't much volcanicity in mid-Silurian times in England and Wales. There's a lot, for example, in the Czech Republic, but the Czech Republic at the time we're speaking of uh, was thousands of kilometers away across an ocean. That's not to say that volcanic ash doesn't travel. It does. So it could be that the Czech Republic was responsible for the volcanicity which gave us this exceptional biota. But the obvious candidate actually is near a home. Um, some of you might re recognize this beautiful landscape. This is the Dingle Peninsula in Southwest Ireland. So if you jump off here and start to swim, the next stop is New England. Um, 
And here you've got Silurian deposits of the right age with volcanic rock of the right type to give us the ash. And this was not too far away from Herefordshire at the time we're speaking about. So maybe, just maybe, we have to really clap our hands and thank our Irish friends for the volcanic ash, which, which gave us this wonderful, exceptionally preserved biota. Okay, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful lecture. Now, I'm sure we've got some questions. We have a roving mic somewhere. Very good. Oh, very convenient. Is it on? Yes. Um, the, uh, well, I don't know whether you touched on this, really, but how quickly would, um, I mean, what are we talking about? Days, minutes, hours would it take to um, fossil, get to, for, for these uh, things to be, to be preserved? Yeah. And secondly, why aren't some of them uh, in a state of decay that are fossilized? Um, both are very good and elementary questions. In terms of the timing, um, we can do some actual paleontology and look at decay rates. We can actually get animals in the lab and see how they decay. But you don't need to be a scientist and have a laboratory to do this. If a worm dies in your garden tomorrow, within 24 hours, the body fluids have oozed out, and you've got a two-dimensional animal, not a three-dimensional animal. So just intuitively, the Herefordshire biota, for example, has to be preserved like that, almost instantaneously. It's just going to be frozen in time. That was the point I, I made with this. This thing here has got no distortion no decay whatsoever. So it has to be instantaneous inrush of the mineralization to, to preserve the, the three-dimensionality. It also probably has to be smothered rather quickly so that scavengers can't actually prey on it. All of these factors probably paid a part. Sorry, the second point was? Uh, why aren't some fossils? Because, because I think... I think they were, they, they were, in the case of Herefordshire, they were mineralized very quickly and smothered and incorporated into the nodule very quickly. We know from uh, geochemical work that the nodule formation was probably almost peony contemporaneous with the formation of calcite to preserve the three-dimensionality of the fossil itself. And undoubtedly the nodule then... Um, preserved the long-term uh, prospects of the fossil. Who's next? So, was there something in the Cambrian or uh, early Paleozoic that kind of allowed this exceptional preservation? Um, that's been the subject of papers by other colleagues, uh, particularly the, Cambri uh, the uh, Cambridge group. And it seems as if in the, in the Cambrian the, the was widespread uh, anoxia, uh, which helped to preserve uh, animals. I mean, exceptional preservation comes about through a number of factors. Uh, one uh, is in entrapment in some way. An animal is preserved in ice or pickled in some way, or mummified in some way. An animal is smothered very quickly. That also helps. And if uh, animals die and are preserved in anoxic environments, reduced oxygen conditions, that also cuts down microbial decay. So in the Cambrian, it, it's thought that anoxia was widespread in some areas and at some times, and this probably helped. Also, uh, there's a question of um, bioturbation. And it seems that bioturbation, animals going through the, the mud, um, was an increased factor in the Ordovician. And to some extent, that may have been responsible for cutting out the taphonomic window 
which is present in the Cambrian, because heaven knows the Cambrian has more than a respectable share, more than its fair share of exceptionally preserved biotas. Mm -hmm. Um, if you had a choice, where would you like to find a large stat in the future? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's it's one of the nice things about a, a paleontologist job that whenever you go out into the field, you, you don't know really what you're going to find. Uh, all the blockbuster large stat was, you know, chanced upon by, by accident. I mean, legend has it that Walcott was riding his horse and stumbled across a block and got off and there was a Burgess Yale fossil. Um, the Chenjiang biota, it's one of the blockbusters, at least equal to um, to, to uh, Burgess. By the way, um, we we helped to to write the Chinese government application to make uh, Chenjiang a world heritage site, and it achieved that status in St. Petersburg. UNESCO approved it as a world heritage site last year. Um, where would I go? Anywhere there is field work to be done. The Herefordshire fauna was 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 discovered in a way by chance. Uh, and some diligence. Um, it's serendipity. And where would I like to go? I mean, I've been to China. I've been to Herefordshire. The Welsh borderlands is a place in my in my heart. Um, uh, anywhere there are fossils, that's our business. Two at the back. Oh, one side. A few years ago, there was a. A fraud perpetrated in China. I think it was a, a bird fossil, yeah. and it was very well done and fooled people for some time. Yes. Uh, are you concerned that this is still <laughs> going on? Yes, uh, I know the incident you're talking about, and of course, it, it brought huge disrepute onto the individuals and institutes involved, um, and that was unfortunate. I'm not concerned that uh, we have any such incidents with Chen Jiang. Um, what they did in that case was effectively fabricate different pieces of vertebrate and, and put them together. But this is not a new uh, activity. Victorian paleontologists were doing this with ammonites in order to sell them for financial gain. Help down man as well. Yes, exactly. So the answer to your question is, it's unfortunate and it really shouldn't happen these days, but where finances are concerned, it does happen. I mean, um, you know, the asking price when I went to try and buy a dino bird, and I thought, well, maybe ethically I can't do it. And you can't now. Chinese have stopped all export. In theory, there shouldn't be a Chen Jiang fossil outside China. There shouldn't be a Chinese vertebrate outside China. But if you go to the Tucson Rock and Mineral Fair, which has occurred recently in America, there are dealers who will sell you them. But when I inquired four years ago, could I have a dino bird for my exhibition? The asking price was 30,000. So it's big money. And it's not easy to see how, you know, poorly paid Chinese people who work on the land would see a way of, uh, I say Chinese, it could be Westerners who would encourage them. Um, it, it's not easy to, to it, it's easy to see the, the, the way that this could happen. But no, Chen Jiang fossils are Chen Jiang fossils. They're not fabricated. Herefordshire fossils are virtual fossils. So you might you might say they're fabricated, but they're not. I'm glad to hear. And lastly, the gentleman in uh, in blue, isn't it? There, there we are. Sir. So. Uh, hello. Um, does exceptional preservation of soft material only happen in uh, fine material like shales and volcanic ash, or does it happen in coarser material as well? Yeah, it can happen in coarser material, but of course, if you're going to get the fidelity of detail, which I've demonstrated hopefully tonight, then you need fine material to um, truly replicate the original morphology. But you can get uh, you can get uh, exceptionally preserved biotas in, in coarser material. For for example, the the famous Eddie Akron biota of uh, late Precambrian age. Uh, is in sandstones, some of them relatively coarse sandstones, but you have got soft and fragile soft-bodied fossils preserved. So it helps, but it's, it, 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 it's not absolutely necessary if it's fine, fine sediment. Well, we'll draw to a close there. We have um, 
glass of wine awaiting us outside, which sounds great. David, thank you very much for your wonderful lecture. I was thinking what these are. This is the Pompeii of Herefordshire. <laughs>